Okay, I, I totally spaced out getting the secret word quiz posted to Blackboard, so I will immediately upon leaving this classroom, I'll walk to my office and post that quiz, so within 10 or 15 minutes of the end of class, you, know, you should be able to enter the word. Uh, yeah, I... I um, so this is a, a word that you don't see in usage any longer, except for in the phrase "pour over." Um, and I don't think it, I think most people understand when you say, you know, look, I wanted to pour over the homework and look for mistakes or something like that. The phrase "pour over" is is fairly well understood. Um, the reason I'm choosing it is because that came into my head when it put under duress here on trying to figure out a word. Also, I think it's an interesting word in that when people write pour over, they tend to think of it as pour over, which is what you do with milk on cereal. And it's something entirely different. And I am certainly hoping that there's someone in the English department posting the simple C++ program of the day. <laughs> why am I entering, why do I always enter year, month, day? It's a, yeah, exactly. It's a sorting issue. So if I do if I do a listing of all the files in here, I got some I, mm, I've got some junk in there. But if you basically look at it, the fifth of the month, seventh of the month, tenth, right? This is in February, and then it goes to March, and it'll go into April. It goes all the way back to January. So I end up with getting a directory listing that's in chronological order, for order by year, month, day. So that's why I'm doing that. What we're going to do today is we're going to continue with analyzing this Joust project. And we took a, hopefully took a big step forward using that sequence diagram. I want to basically spend the entire day today looking at that sequence diagram and talking about its utility and how that actually starts translating to code. So there's uh, a lot of stuff there for us to talk about. And that means Friday, probably won't be till Friday that I talk about technical stuff related to the project. There's some technical information that needs to be discussed regarding constructors, uh, specifically initialization lists, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk about that. So for those who are trying to get a jump on the project, uh, that's something you want to hunt for and learn how to use. That'll be key to getting this project done successfully. Uh, we're in the middle of assignment eight. Before I dive into this project, or dive into today's tasks, does anyone have any questions you want to ask about either Joust or the current assignment or anything else C++ esque? Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's what's called me dropping the ball. Um, if you, you can, but you should be able, you should be able to go to those, it's the same three sites, right? And all you have to do is look for the topic headings for arrays. And so, uh, uh, yes, if you'll forgive me and just take that step, I could ferret out that it's section 3.2 or whatever, but literally all I do is I go to those pages and I look for the word array, find out what sections there and post the post it there. So that's, it should be uh, fairly easy for you to find exactly what it is I would have posted. There is, I, on the subject though, I will bring to your attention now this site, which is my site. Hang on. 
Oops. Um, try to get something here that fits on the page. What is August Council? August Council, so prior to me becoming an academic, I was a working professional, and so I had a uh, I did a lot of independent consulting, and I had a limited liability corporation called August Council, uh, and so that's what that is. <clears throat> the only there's hardly anything left to the site now, except some odd stuff I'm putting up, like this stuff you're looking at right now. Um, so it's AugustCouncil.com tilde t Gibson slash tutorial, and. Right now, what we're the next topic of discussion is going to be pointers. And what I would do is I would say, uh, since we're working with arrays, go ahead and, and look at this link. But if you click on basic arrays, what it says is this assumes you've already gone through the pointers tutorial. So I'm basically teaching it backward in the class from the way I have the tutorials ordered uh, here on this site. Uh, that said, it, I, to the extent you have any bandwidth at all, I really recommend you definitely, as we move forward, are going to need to look at those two tutorials, but uh, I would recommend you do it this week. It would even help you understand a lot that I haven't talked about yet regarding Assignment 8. There are a lot of pointers tutorials out there on the web. Um, I don't like the way most of them flow, and one thing... I'm not saying it's better or it's worse, but it's definitely different from any other way of presenting the information. So if you want a totally different way of, of a presentation of, this, of these topics, then check those out. All right. So let's talk about sketch. Sketchbook Express. Just sequence.tiff. I don't know why it's like not the recent, but the oldest things I've opened up are in here. You can tell that I've done this presentation before. Uh, okay, I'll have to dig around in the file system to find it then. There it is. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Any qu I need I really need you to be aggressive with me at this point and I need you to be willing to raise your hand and tell me that you don't get this or I don't get a particular part of this. I really need you all to let me know what is not clicking for you on this diagram at this point. Uh, yes? Uh, the question mark, is that now that you confirm whether you have enough stamina or not, is that what you would ask if you uh, the question mark. Yes, that's precisely correct. So th this was stuff that I wanted you to go ahead and do. And in fact, I will probably give you, uh, it's a little late, uh, I may give you a few minutes. Maybe I'll just walk us through it. But yes, that's exactly right. After, so following this thread here, Maine is asking Starry to wield the weapon. And so what Starry does is ask the lance, how much stamina does it require to use you? And this, the lance replies with that amount. 
Then you do the bit of math here to reduce the stamina required for, sorry, reduces Starry's stamina by the stamina required. And then, absolutely, the next step is to then Mm-hmm. And then Lance asks Todd, um, you have the rate, yeah, or the random Yeah, so uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of correct stuff. Let me just catch up to you here. So right after this, then I... Why is that not... Yeah, okay. Sorry, trying to figure out how to get my straight line here. But is that, are you able to read that green? I know it's a little bright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to be, did you hit? When Starry turned to the Lance and asked, did you hit, then what did the Lance do? The Lance talks to Todd. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I have this true-false here. This is, I'm having problems with real estate. I'm going to rewrite this somewhere else. So that's what is being returned at the end of the day. I'm going to put uh, right, mm, I'll put away over here, true-false. <clears throat> Okay, so when the Lance is asked, did you hit, the Lance turned to me and said, get. And what did I come back with? Some number. And, and what I... It, we're doing this. We're doing this diagram informally. Okay, so there are certain conventions to the diagram, such as what kind of information you would put here, whether this would be here or not, it would follow some specific convention. I'm doing it informally. All right. So I don't, frankly, remember what the formal way would be for me to show that I'm returning a random number between one and a hundred. So by golly, I'm just going to write. Something between 1 and 100 comes back. All right? As long as you know what it means and I know what it means, that's all we need. We just need this diagram to work. We don't have to follow a bunch of stupid rules. And once that number between 1 and 100 comes back, what does Lance do with that number? Does it check it to see if it's within the, whether it hits or not? And yes, that's absolutely correct. The Lance checks this number to see whether or not it's a hit. How is that determined specifically? The Lance has a certain hit percentage, and if the number is within that percentage, because it returns a proportion. Right. So, so we're dealing with the proportions as whole numbers, just for the ease of it. And the Lance has an attribute called hit chance, and that hit chance will be represent some percentage between 1 and 100. And this is a random number between 1 and 100. So the Lance is going to do a little check, which is if the random number is less than or equal to the hit chance, true. then return true. So now I have this arrow coming back. And what I'm going to do is, I'm really running out of real estate here, so I'm just going to say what's returned is either true or false. And this is a dashed line. So what I don't have enough real estate to represent is I say if the random number is less than or equal to the hit chance, I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. So either a true or a false is being returned back to the object that called the function in the first place, which is starry. Now, once starry gets that true or that false back, then what does starry do with it? And that's exactly what we have here with the blue line that was done on Monday. 
is that true or false is sim quite simply received from the lance and then given right back to me, right? And, and so I, I've emphasized this before, and I'll emphasize it again. Hopefully you did it between Monday and Wednesday. If not, it's really going to hugely help you understand how this code is going to fit together. You take this diagram, print it out, or put it on part of your screen, and you play that little role-playing thing that we did up here, and you watch as these people talk, and you will find they will follow this, line, this set of lines exactly. They'll turn to each other, ask questions, turn to me, ask for a random number, they'll look down at their sheet of paper, compare the number I gave them with their hit chance, and then they'll turn around and say true or false, and that person will turn around to Maine and say the true or the false. Okay? Yes? So would the next step be to do the very same communication or dialogue between Stormy and Maine and its uh, sword and talk? Absolutely. So we end up taking basically everything right here with wield, down to this return. So this whole sequence of stuff right here, that entire thing is repeated where instead these arrowheads go to Stormy and instead these arrowheads go to Sword, right? Yes, so yes? What is the dashed versus the solid one? So the dashed is, uh, what it translates to in code is it translates to a return statement. So if you have, not thinking about object-oriented programming, but thinking about functions generally, they do a whole bunch of stuff, and eventually they return either a value or they otherwise end uh, with a return statement. And that is precisely what the dashed line is representing, is that return, that ending of the function. Okay. Other questions on what we have so far? So the wheels just... And then after you do it twice, then if either one of those is true, then the round's over. Right. So now let's let's add a little bit. Of, let's add a couple lines to this. Um, I'm going to erase this stuff in red here. Reclaim some of this. Todd. Yes. Instead of rewriting all that stuff again, can you set it on a kind of a loop so it just switches over to the next? <coughs> So the question is, if I ha uh, could I avoid rewriting all this stuff again if I had a loop? There are a couple, there are two or three answers to the question. The first is, the only motivation for me writing anything down on the diagram is for me to gain an understanding of how the program works. If you understand that there is another knight and a weapon and this exact same sequence works with that other knight and weapon, there's no reason to write it, right? That's just gratuitous. Uh, the second way of answering it is as a programming question. Um, can I avoid having all this code occur two times by using a loop? Um, it is possible. It's a little bit, it ends up at our 111 level, it ends up being more trouble than it's worth. It's far easier just to do it two times. You create a night variable k1, you create another night variable k2, you ask k1 to wield, and then you ask k2 to wield far, far easier than, than trying to do it in a loop. If I did it in a loop, then I'd create an array of two knights, and and it, it gets weird, because you'd have to say, uh, if knight sub i dot wield is true, then knight sub i plus one percent one percent two. I, I I have to think about it. It's weird because if one if zero hits, one has to fall off the horse. If one hits, zero has to fall off the horse. So my numbers are switching around. Yes, I mean, it's it's eminently doable. It, um, it's just more trouble than it's worth. <clears throat> All right. So uh, the question is then, what happens after this wield? So again, main is this dark line here on the far left. Main asked, Starry, are you exhausted? Came back with false. Starry asked, are you on your horse? Again, for real estate reasons, I didn't put that in, but there's another line going to Starry, are you on your horse? And then Starry returned true for yes, Starry's on the horse. And then we had the exact same pair of lines for Stormy. 
Are you on your horse? Are you exhausted? We assume that all those came back with the right answers. So now we have uh, main asking starry to wield. That's here. And then main suddenly gains control right here. All right? Here's where main loses control, meaning that the thread of code execution is going into other code. That thread of execution only comes back when all this is done and a true or a false comes back. So the question is, if main asked starry to wield and starry said true, then what should main do? The, the question will definitely be asked of the other knight, so Stormy will be asked to wield as well, but uh, we should, we're going to be given, as soon as I ask Starry to wield, Starry is going to come back with a true or a false. If that comes back true, I need to take action right at that moment, because I've been, it's in my catcher's mitt, right? So you turn to the uh, other knight and tell him they're off the horse. Turn to the other knight and tell them they're off the horse. Absolutely. So what I can do is I can I can do a little notation here so I know what's happening. I can say if true was returned, then what I want to do is turn to turn to Stormy all the way over here. And remember there's a wagging of the finger and main set unhorse yourself. <laughs> Jerk. I don't think that was said. But. <laughs> unhorse yourself. And when you ask when you ask Stormy to unhorse yourself, what does Stormy do? <clears throat> That's right, there could be a rebellion, but you see you'd have to actually code it that way and that'd be awkward. Yes. Uh, has he already asked the head or is this before it does it is, it is before you have asked uh, Stormy to wield. However, regardless, regardless of whether or not you ask Stormy to wield, you can then turn around and, excuse me, I, I misspoke. Regardless of whether or not you ask Stormy to unhorse yourself, you can still ask Stormy to wield, right? So the, the key here is uh, we give both knights a chance to wield prior to coming all the way up to the top here and asking these questions right here again. So when I ask Stormy to unhorse yourself, what is Stormy going to do? Give me a line of C++ code. Yes, that's correct. Why am I not copy? That's what I wanted. So the, this is the knight's data. We decided that there was a boolean called on horse. So if you ask the knight to unhorse yourself, remember this is at the point where main turned to the knight and said unhorse yourself, and then the knight looked down and scratched out the true and changed it to false where unhorse was written. You'll be able to follow this, as I said, you'll be able to take this diagram, watch that role play redo, and it'll follow this entire diagram. So this is on horse. I don't have enough space to write it properly. On horse equals false. And then oops, then it's just a return so return does not necessarily mean returning information. The return could mean return in this context simply means relinquishing control. You're done with the function, right? So even though a function is void doesn't mean that the function doesn't return. The function always returns. It's whether or not data is returned designates whether that's void or has a, a type there like int or float or bool.
Sure. Uh, let's talk about it. <coughs> let me let me go ahead and, and finish the thought. So let me write this, and then I'll I'll talk about it a little bit. <coughs> when I write a mathematical function. And I say, uh, what do we got going here? And I say f of x is equal to x squared. So this is a mathematical function, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly write this function in C++ terms. I can say that this function is going to give me a floating point number and my function is called f and what it's going to take is it's going to take a floating point number as an argument I'll call it x and what this function is going to do is it's going to create a, a temporary variable or a local variable float y and then I will say that y is equal to uh, x, x times x and then the last line here, and I apologize for those who aren't in the front row that I'm getting a little low here. Uh, then I return x. Does everyone buy into this three-line function? Okay, it's a little messy. I apologize. Here, primary. I got myself a cool handwriting tool right here. Float f float x. I'm going to create a floating point variable called y. I'll say y is equal to x times x, and then I'm going to return at, uh, y. Did I say that there? Ooh, no, I didn't. All right. So then maybe that's why I had the silences. I'm just not making a lot of sense here. Everyone, everyone cool with that as, an, as a C++ representation of a mathematical function? All right. That's where, that's where these functions are coming from, is this understanding of functions in mathematics. What the language is giving us is the opportunity to do processing in this function without the requirement of returning a number. So what if I create, I'm going to leave that there, I'm going to create a function called h, and maybe I'll take a, an input as well. And what this function is going to do is it's going to say, Hi, Mom. What am I? Oh, maybe. No, that's not right. Um, Hi, Mom. I am holding the number x. There we go. So my... I'm escaping from mathematics now in that I'm doing things that you don't have in mathematics, right? You don't ha have in the mathematical formula there the little printing out to the screen stuff. But generically, I can do some, run some algorithm inside this function, and when I'm done running the algorithm, the function ends. And so I can say I can show that the function ends by putting the word return. But if I don't have any information to return, there's no sense in me giving x back. They gave x to me. Um, the language gives me the option of writing a function where I'm not required to provide information back. So this return ends the function and provides the caller with a floating point number. This ends the function but provides the caller nothing. And in using these functions, I could say something like float w equals f 3.14. That's going to call this function here, passing in the 3.14. It's going to square it, and whatever the square of that is is going to be assigned to w. If I try to say w equals h, then it will not even compile. It'll say, what are you talking about? H does not return any information. How can I return absolutely, how can I assign absolutely nothing to W? And that's nonsensical to the compiler. Okay? So that's, that's what the return type is. 
Uh, you've probably written a lot of functions that are void functions where you don't have this word return. And that's just permissible by the language. If you don't have a return, basically the function returns once it hits a closed curly brace. Uh, it'll actually, you know, it'll actually do it on uh, normal functions as well. However, that generally, uh, it'll generate a, it should generate a warning. Uh, so let me do this. <coughs> All right, so I have an empty... I, I've copied those two functions here. I'm going to compile it. Uh, it's already unhappy with me. Whoops. Because I need to put this stuff up higher. All right, so these are the same two functions. All right, so the functions are fine. If I remove this from a function that's expecting to return a float and I try compiling it, okay, I get a warning the control, so what I'm calling, remember, I'm, I think I've sometimes referred to this maybe as the thread of control. So you see that word again, control. Control is reaching the end of a non-void function. It's reached the end of the function and you haven't given me anything back. Probably not, not going to want to do that, so that's why the warning is being thrown. Uh, there, the reason it's a warning and isn't an error is because you could be writing code, this is a bit nonsensical, but I could say something like if true, return that. So how often is that function going to return a value? Or excuse me, um, I'll just do it that way. How many times is this function going to, how many times is this if statement going to be true? 100% of the time, yeah? Okay, so you know and I know that it, we will always get a return here. However, oh, the compiler knows too. Damn you. <laughs> so let me say uh, bool b equals true. Now if, if I do that. There we go. All right. So the compiler thinks that uh, there may be a problem and it's throwing me a warning. However, you know and I know that b is true 100% of the time. That'll be true 100% of the time. We will hit this return statement 100% of the time. So that's why it's giving me a warning and not a compile error. It's because we may know what we're doing. All right. Any other questions regarding the return type? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, the compiler's finicky. Um, yeah. No more to say about that. The compiler's the compiler. I have a question on this. You, uh, before you you mentioned something about uh, I, this um, chart being able to easily identify where the functions belong. So let so that that's the final two topics I want to one of two topics I want to talk about right now. All right. There are actually three things I want to talk about. I'm under the gun now. First, I want to. Uh, talk just a little bit about the process of analyzing this problem and designing a solution. When we first began doing this and I asked what happened was um, we were doing the role play. Main asked Starry to wield. Starry got the stamina required and subtracted it and then I kind of opened it up and I said, okay, what is Starry going to do now? And everyone knew that there had to be a comparison of a random number to the hit chance. So what someone offered is they offered up this, is they said, the next thing you should do is you should have an arrow going over here and what it should be asking the Lance is to get the hit chance. And what would happen is the hit chance would come back here. This is a dashed line. The hit chance comes back. And once you have the hit chance here, then Starry would go ahead and ask me for the random number. I give Starry a random number. And then the comparison is done and the true or false is returned. So the difference is 
In the stuff in green that's a little bit covered up, and I'll erase my scribbling here in a minute, you're asking the weapon, did you hit? And it's the weapon interrogating the random number generator and doing the comparison. In the stuff I outlined in gray, Starry is asking the Lance for the number, and then the Lance is asking me for a random number, and the Lance is doing the comparison. Okay, so it's very it's very simple behavior. All it is is get a random number, compare it to the hit chance to determine whether it's true or false. Yes, but the issue I'm presenting with you here is where should that behavior sit? Should the knight be responsible for that behavior? Or should the weapon be responsible for that behavior? And these are the kinds of questions that you spend hours and days and weeks debating in design teams, is where should the behavior sit? Now, the argument that I'll present to you here for having it the way we have it written in green is that the hit chance is private data. And how you use that hit chance is none of the knight's business. Right? That is an algorithm that is intimate to uh, what it means to have a hit chance. And let me give you another reason. If you look back at the, orig the original materials where it talks about the game designer saying, well, we're going to want to make it complex and add in a bunch of variables and stuff, you want to have all that stuff in weapon because what will happen is uh, let's say that rather than it being a hit chance, there end up being five variables that end up being compared, and there's some complex algorithm you got to look at to determine whether or not there's a hit in, for the weapon. Well, what's wonderful, the way we have it designed, is none of this code changes. All the nuts, even if we go to five variables in a complex algorithm, Starry still says, did you hit? and then just kicks back, right? You don't change one line of code here. All of the code would change would be right here. So we're localizing any modifications down the road to where that data is sitting if it goes from no longer being hit chance but five variables. I mean, how would you deal with that? If you before you said get hit chance, suddenly you have to say get hit chance, get this, get that, add a couple numbers together, figure out something else, get another number, right? You see how that makes it a lot more complex for the night? So by properly, and this is where we get back to that original term, terms abstraction and encapsulation. We want to encapsulate the data with the behavior that's operating on that data. All right? So it's beyond the scope of this class for me to spend the next four weeks presenting problems of this nature, which I would love to do. Uh, but that's part of what 511 is for, should you decide to go on there. CSCI 511. It's called object-oriented programming. It's um, kind of an advanced object-oriented programming. You look at problem solving from an object-oriented perspective. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, what was just asked a minute ago is what is it? how does this translate to functions? So first of all, if you have a solid arrowhead going to one of these lines, that means that that is a member function of the class. So you see we have RU exhausted going to Starry. What if when main turned to Starry and said RU exhausted, did main provide any information to that night when the question was asked? Did they say, are you exhausted? And oh, by the way, here's the number 23? Yeah. No. All right. So that's why I have empty braces empty parentheses here because no information is provided. What kind of thing is being given back when that is asked of Starry? A Boolean. So now I can come here. We know that the Knight class is going to give a Boolean back. It belongs to the Knight class. It's called Are You Exhausted? And what does the knight do when the knight is asked that question? This stuff right here. The knight looks down at his clipboard and looks at the stamina and asks the question, is this stamina greater than zero? If it is, return false, otherwise return true. If stamina, where did, that, where did this variable come from? Came in the class declaration, right? Here's the data for night. Here's one of them right here. Every night has a stamina. This is on the clipboard, yeah, that each night is holding. 
if stamina is greater than zero, are, are you exhausted is false. Else, there you go. I've just written one of your functions for you. you, you do you see how this chart can help you understand what functions you have and what your functions should do? Okay. A clean one. Oh, you mean the original template? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, I can do that. All right, uh, I'll do that. So let me, uh, I'm not done yet. I'm, I need to waste, I need to go with the final two minutes here. Where does the function begin and end? That's what these thick lines are representing. So you can see that it begins with the call and it ends at the return, but you can basically look at the thick line to see the lifetime. The most interesting function here is wield, because wield begins here and a whole bunch of stuff is happening. And so what's going to happen is Starry is going to interrogate the, the Lance for get stamina required. That's given back. A little math is done, and then it's going to tell the Lance, did you hit? And it's going to get back a true or a false, and then it's going to return it. Right? So we have one, two, three, I don't know, four or five lines of code for wield. Here's another thing that this chart shows us that we don't necessarily get through um, this initial exercise of trying to figure out what the data is. And that is, what is the relation, first of all, what is the relationship between main and weapon? What is the, real, think about either looking at this or thinking about when everyone was standing up here, what was main doing with weapon? Nothing. Main never had, spoke a word to weapon. Main has no idea that weapon even exists. However, the knight is very intimately aware of the existence of the, the weapon, right? So give me, give me a, a phrase to describe the relationship between the knight and the weapon. Every knight has a weapon. Has a weapon. Exactly. And has a is a term that is very significant in object-oriented design. Okay. What that means, let me give you some other hazas. A knight has a name. A knight has a stamina. A knight has a, on horse, a knight has a weapon. That is private data of knight. Every night you ever create, meaning I create Starry, I create Stormy, Starry has weapon in hand, Stormy has weapon in hand. Put it together for me. When I ask Starry to wield, give me a line of code for this get stamina required. Give me a C++ line of code for that. How does Starry ask the weapon for the stamina required? Weapon not weapon not get. Weapon is the name of a type. It's not the name of a variable. Um, not Lance. Lance is the name of the is the type of the weapon. I need a variable, right? Remember you did this web counter wc, and then you said wc dot get. You did not say web counter dot get. Um, so right, bad, huh? What's the name of the variable? L. It's not L. I'll give you a hint. I typed it in in under 120 seconds ago. Do, have I created a weapon? Does every knight have a weapon? Weapon in hand. Weapon in hand. <laughs> yes. Weapon in hand dot get stamina required. That is what this line here is. Yes? It's like this here. You all didn't even blink when I said stamina minus equals stamina required because you all know that this stamina right here is the private data of night. Yes? You didn't say int minus equals stamina required. You said what the name of that integer was, the stamina. The name of this integer is stamina. The name of this Boolean is on horse. The name of this weapon is weapon in hand. Okay? So this here is a line of code 
in uh, Knight's wield function. How's weapon in hand different from naming the, the new weapon class? So what? So what? How's it different from declaring a weapon object? It isn't. All you're doing is your. The analogy is the blueprint of the house. Uh, if you have a blueprint of a house, it also includes a picture of what the kitchen should look like. Every house I create has a kitchen, so there's a kitchen variable created by virtue of creating a house. There is a weapon variable created by virtue of creating a knight. So they be labeled the same then? Starry. Every knight. So Starry is going to have a weapon in hand. Stormy is going to have a weapon in hand. How do you determine like, what that weapon is? We have, we have like, multiple different types of weapons. Uh, that'll happen at an... So that's something I need to talk about on Friday. That'll happen at initialization time. You'll get the information from the user. You will create a knight, and you give that knight five pieces of information. The knight's name, the knight's stamina, but you also give that knight the weapon type, weapon hit chance, and weapon stamina, and the knight creates the weapon. Should the stamina be created upon all the knights instead of being assigned to the research panel? Because if you'll ask the user, you ask the user those five pieces of information, including what is the knight's stamina, the user says 32, and then you create the knight, and one of the pieces of information you give that knight through a constructor is the number 32, and that knight assigns that 32 to his stamina. I would, I would argue that it shouldn't be that way, though, because then you could say, you know, 5,000, and then yeah, yes, but you have to keep in mind we're not creating a finished game. We are creating code so that the designers can experiment with different numbers to find good values that are sane. I have a question on Project 8 that I solved, but I want to know why.